Today we've got with us Joe Ward. Um, Joe is going to be talking today about 40 years in aviation. Step forward, Joe. So make yourself comfortable, <laughs> clutch your seatbelts, and join me on a trip down memory lane. People do all sorts of things for crust. Some are farmers, some are fishermen, some are flyers. I became a flyer. I had my first command on the 1st of May, 1943. My last command on the 30th of April, 1983. Now, if you put those figures in the African computer shape, it works out that I was a pilot, a working pilot, for 40 years. For the first 20 years, I flew fixed wing aircraft. Uh, we can run for a minute. That one. Uh, I've flown fixed wing. I've flown 11 different types. From the Catalina flying boat. Forward. Keep an eye on this one here. Yeah, that's right. From the Catalina flying boat to the jet bomber. I've had several incidents in the air, but I got them safely back on the ground. I then gave it all away, and for the next 20 years, I flew helicopters. I've flown 10 different helicopters, and I've crashed four times. <laughs> well, I'd say I'm still here to talk about it. first one was my fault. I'll agree to that. The second one, I was at 5,500 feet crossing a mountain ridge in Malaya when it hit a wind shear. That smashed me into the jungle. Made me eyes water a bit, that one did. <laughs> the third one was in Nigeria. We were working, the company was working for Shell BP. So we were flying the medium sized helicopter, the Sikorsky 55. The cost was working over the mangroves and the river deltas, the aircraft was on pontoons, fixed pontoons. Nothing wrong with that, a lot of fun on water. But the point is, with a fixed pontoon, when you're coming to land, you must make sure you have no forward movement on it. But if you hit the ground with forward movement, your arse over tip before you can get where you are. <laughs> so it's convertible. This day, I've taken the crew change to the rig. i completed the crew change. Uh, I had four passengers on board. We landed at a golf course called Sapoli, destroyed three, and then I um, took the other one heading for home. We, we were five minutes into the flight, but the hydraulics failed. Now, the S-55, if it is properly twinned, is about the biggest helicopter that one can manually handle. When you start getting bigger than that, of course, they have primary system, secondary system, sometimes tertiary. Just if so, why they had a primary system, so it was in manual. Unfortunately, I had a blade that was a little bit out of track, which meant the aircraft was doing what it want, almost wanted to do. I realised that I couldn't fly this home, I wouldn't have enough strength. If I had wheels, I could have continued and did a running landing about 25 knots. But with pontoons, I had to come to halt, so with the strength, I had to double back to the golf course. As I slowed down to come to land, the outer blade track started taking the effect of the helicopter and it was beginning to waltz slowly from side to side. When I actually came to the halt, it was just doing as it liked, just like that. And I said to my passenger, hang on, I'm going to throw this thing on the ground, which is what I did. Being a clever bastard, knowing that the blade's reflection cut off the tail, I lifted up the collective. But I wasn't clever enough, you see, because the buoyancy of the pontoons bounced the helicopter back at the disc it was a very large, expensive sound. The aircraft <laughs> jumped 90 degrees in the air before I could control it. I got it back on the ground and uh, shut off, turned off the engine. And when it came to rest, I looked outside the window and I was so embarrassed because my tail cone and the tail rose were lying down there. That was supposed to be stuck in the back. <laughs> the fourth one was in Tasmania. The smaller aircraft, the Bell 47. And we were working at Scotts River Dam. I'd got two passengers uh, out there, and I was heading down the valley, um, about 100 feet up, when the tail rotor ship drive shaft sheared. The aircraft went into a spin. It had completed almost two spins before I could realize what had happened. And the cause of the spin, you see, with the loss of the tail rotor, was caused by the engine. So the only way to stop the spin was to stop the engine. I'm going to crash anyhow, and just confirm it now by switching off the engine. <laughs> I did about another 90 degrees before I controlled it, I think, a three and a quarter 
he turned, and instead of facing up the valley, I was facing up the slope of the hill. And as the aircraft arrived at the hill, I used the remaining of the kinetic energy from the main blade to push the landing. The nose, the skids hit first, and the aircraft fell backwards down the slope of the hill. The port skid was supported, the starboard one wasn't, she twisted and broke her back. When my hand got hit the ground out of control, it has the tendency to fly in lots of little bit, bits and pieces. That is not the time to be there. <laughs> one learned to become fleet of foot. <laughs> and nobody could have beaten me for speed over the first 50 yards. Not even Mr. Bolt. <laughs> so that was that was the the uh, the helicopter result business. What does next? Uh, uh, I I stepped here. Uh, these days I stepped carefully now. Uh, I've dabbled in three wars. World War II against the Germans. Cold War against the Russians. The war communi against the communists in Malaya. I've been within inch of death when a 250 million candle power third flash cable loose in the bomb bay. I've been shot at. I've been bombed. I've been cooked, I've been frozen. Um, I was bitten by a bug in Malaya to paralyze the arm. I was seasonal facial. I was flying one day in, in a, a helicopter. And I ran into a flat sea, flock, a flock of seagulls. I dodged them all by one. It slipped on the disc, smashed through the windshield, and wrapped itself around the face. By a seagull facial. <laughs> I don't recommend a seagull pie. They say it's awful. <laughs> so, uh, and I've, I've been charged by a wild bull, wild bull in, in, uh, in the Amazon, not in Amazon, in, in the Kimberley. I've had four frames on the helicopter, so I stepped carefully these days. I'm running out of options, I think. But flying allowed me to do many things. I've flown around this world of ours. I've travelled over 600 miles an hour. And I've seen the curvature of the Earth from 60,000 feet. You've seen pictures of our world from our outer space with a blue halo. I sat on top of that blue halo. Very lonely up there. It's very cold. Minus 55 centigrade. The colours are beautiful and the view is majestic. I was over northwest England when it happened, flying south. When I looked to my left, I could see across the whole of England and the North Sea in the distance. When I looked to my right, I could see the Atlantic Ocean on the other side of Ireland. If I was over Perth, heading west, at 60,000 feet, I could look down there and see Albany, and look down there and see Geraldton. What was interesting to me in the height was the sky which normally blew above me was below me. I had blue sky beneath me. The sky above me was a deep violet colour. If I could have made it 15,000 feet to 75,000 with the Concord travel, it's black. Perfect violet. Hmm? Now, our eyes are wonderful instruments, but they are limited. Of the electromagnetic spectrum from the sun, all we can see is the white light in the centre, which is known as the optical window. You all know if you put white light through a prism or a raindrop, you get the colours of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and it goes past. The red end of the spectrum have a long rays, which gives us their beautiful sunrise and the sunsets. But beyond the red is infrared. We can't see that. And beyond infrared is TV. We can't see that either. And beyond that is radar. We can't see that either. But we can utilize those properties with instruments. Infrared we can feel. You switch on electric fire before the element glows red, you can feel the heat. That's infrared. The other end spectrum, which is the the last colour we can see is violet. Beyond violet, it's ultraviolet. We can't see that. 
the beyond the violet is the x-rays we can't see them beyond that are gamma rays we can't see them but again with instruments we can utilize those properties um, Ultraviolet is good for you. I mean, I have trouble with the back. Maybe because I have too many pranks or I don't know. But the doctor, re doctor recommends to see that twice a week, I sunbathe, uh, 15 minutes, front and back, no more. Because ultraviolet is the biggest source of vitamin D. And vitamin D is very good for the old bones. When war World War II started in England, I was 15 years old. Farmer's boy. Uh, lived, on, lived on the farm. The farm was situated in East Anglia between two prime targets. On this side of us, the, the farm was a thousand acres actually. My dad was manager of it. It belonged to a member of parliament. The, it was in the, in the eastern side of England, which before the revolution, the uh, industrial revolution, was nothing but swamps and bogs and marshes and what have you. Um, the people who lived there were known as bog trotters. I come from a long line of bog trotters. But I haven't got my feet, I've grown out of it. <laughs> the farm was situated between two major targets. On this side of us, about 10 miles away, we had the biggest railway marshalling yard in England. And on this side of us, we had Upward Airfield, which is a new bomber base. We were conveniently in the middle. And so the Air Ministry, in their wisdom, decided to turn our farm into a two site. In other words, they built a mock airfield on our farm. Hundreds of telegraph poles were cut down and planted among the crops with a fancy light on top, all controlled from an underground bunker. From the air, it looked like an airfield, runways, parked aircraft, hangars, chance like for landing or whatever. We had fought the battle of Britain and won it, but the German Luftwaffe now were coming through indiscriminate raids. And so when they crossed the East Coast inbound, the purple went up, the airfield went out, the railway yards went up, and we lit up. <laughs> Navigation being what it was in those days, you see the Germans looked down and said, ah, ah, upward. They opened the bomb doors and let everything go. <laughs> and for a period of time there, we were bombed regularly every night. My job in the morning was to get out of the bulldozer, fill in the holes, hop on the treadley, cycle nine miles to school. At 17 and a half, I was conscripted. Everybody knew he was doing a bit. I'd seen enough of the war at this time that I didn't fancy being in the army with a bloody wet pack on my back. <laughs> and as for Navy swimming in the cold North Sea, that didn't appeal to me either. So I decided I would be a pilot. That was a sitting down job. <laughs> I had no idea of the ramifications of that decision, but I hung in there. I was sent to America for training. I went over the Atlantic on the Queen Mary. America had two schools for training pilots out in the west in Arizona. It was known as the Arnold Scheme, that was run by the Army Air Corps. And the other one, known as the Tower Scheme, was down east of America. We started up in Grosseal, uh, and we worked our way down to Pensacola. We started off flying the Boeing Cadet. It's a wonderful little machine, far better than the Tiger Moth. Literally nothing bad on it. Had a steerable tower wheel, tow brakes, all. Oh, quite luxurious. <laughs> and we then went from that to the Texan or the Harvard. From there we went to the Volte Valley. And from there we wound up on the Catalina. Uh, we did a lot of patrols in the Mexican Gulf looking at U boats. I shipped back to the UK, and of course when I returned to the UK, I was basically a surplus to requirement. The battle had been won by this time. There were a lot of people ahead of me waiting to get the squadrons. I never made a squadron. I got as far as AFS flying the Oxford when the two bomb atomic bombs were dropped in Japan and hostilities ceased. So we all had very good drunken time there for a while, but eventually we had to come back to Earth. And when we did, the question was, what was I going to do? I was a farmer's boy. I wasn't going to go back to farm. I had no training in anything. I wasn't even apprenticeship. What was I going to do? And a little voice up here, the grey matter said, you can fly. And I thought, yes, I can. So I 
traveled down to London and went back to school, studied and got a commercial license. And for the next, the next four years, I was a staff pilot at the navigation school around the other Anson. Oh, we went all over the place, all sorts of weathers, it was all the fun. But after four years, I thought, I needed a bit more excitement. But the company made the decision for me, of course, it was mid-December, and I took off that night in a job, and I landed out of one. <laughs> <laughs> it was a government-controlled enterprise, and they pulled the money out. So I was out of work again. But not to worry, it was close to the festive season, I went to London, and stayed with my elder sister. But once the festive season was over, the beginning of January, we hit, we're back to our problem of what we're going to do. For some other reason, I found myself in Ian Broadway. Don't ask me why, but it was here. And I was looking around to do something. I, I wasn't going to go in an office. I, I couldn't work inside. It had to be outside. Would I be a train driver? A bus driver? Policeman? I just didn't know. But it was a Monday morning and it was bed mid-morning and it was time for morning coffee. And I walked down the street looking for a cafe. The delis weren't around then. And as I was looking for the cafe, I walked past the window that had a model aircraft in it. And the brakes went on and I stopped and I looked at it and I thought, magical. When I settled down, I shall make models of all the aircraft I've flown. So I stepped back to read the name of the shop for future reference. Well, it wasn't a shop at all. It was a Royal Air Force recruiting centre. <laughs> so I went in like a rocket because I could get a free coffee here. <laughs> so as I went in, the flight started, and yes, in the morning, it's a terrible morning, isn't it? He said, would you like a coffee? I said, I'd love one. And I said, you gentlemen, sir, there's two hours left. <laughs> coffee was produced and the cigarettes and we sat down and we were chewing the fat I must have said I dropped some Air Force idiom because he suddenly got up and pointed at me and he said you were one of the mob weren't you? I said yes he said what were you? I said I was a driver for Christ's sake come back I said shove off <laughs> he said I guarantee you fly in a month I said not the Air Force yeah, forget it forget it he went on to tell me then that the frontline squadrons were depleted in the sense that so many had gone out. The Russians were playing silly buggers, so I think you see. I went home that night, talked it with, over with my sister, and I came back the following day and saw the sergeant, and I signed on the dotted line for eight years of flying in the Royal Air Force. So I've been in flying in current flying practice. He was right. On the 1st of February, I was jabbed and kitted and in the Air Force again. <laughs> Being in current flying practice, I was immediately sent to um, Cottesmore for instrument rating. I knocked that on the head and then I was posted to two or four advanced flying school at Swindaby. I was given a railway warrant and I travelled up there and I got out the station and there was an awful lot of people on the platform, like myself, all just in blue, wondering what to do. When a corporal, all corporals have loud voices, announced that the bus to Swindon were leaving from gate four in ten minutes. So those who were interested made the way. We climbed on the bus. He took off about three quarters of an hour down the main road. We turned off into the airfield, and there were two sets of hangars. One there, and one there. We turned and went into these hangars. And as the bus got to halt, I had, had a quick squeezing it out, keep on going. And there parked was the Vickers Wellington bomber. And I thought, that's an improvement on the Anderson. <laughs> so I got up to get out, and the corporal with a loud voice said, All those with 204 stay on the bus, six of us sat down again. And we drove from those hangars across the road to those other hangars. And as we went past them, I had a sticky beak inside. Bingo! I'd hit the jackpot. Their spot in the hangar was a Diablo Mosquito. So I was to fly those for the next three years. I converted on the Mark III, did my continuation training on the Mark VI, and then when I joined the squadron, I flew the Mark 34 for day photography 
a Mark 35 for night photography. The only difference here is, is that the Bombay. For 35, we needed to carry photo flashes. The 34, that is closed up and there's a huge tank put in there. The average range of a mosquito is 1750. The Mark 34 was 3,500 miles. God, we used to get a sore ass. <laughs> <laughs> the mosquito was a magnificent aircraft. That was my navigator. The mosquito was a magnificent aircraft, which you saw earlier on. Made of wood. The only thing you see on the propellers, what have you, is the return from radar is almost negligible. When we flew into Gibraltar, they knew we were coming. They had the radars tuned for us as we came around the corner of Spain. They were waiting for us. The next thing you heard was, as we went over the top, thought, Mr. Master to get it. So there wasn't, much, there wasn't any return from the But uh, as I say, it had a range of 3,000 miles. So we were now flying con uh, the Mark 6. We went back to the Mark 6 continuation training. We were constantly now uh, flying at high altitude. And when we were top there, we ran into two phenomena we knew nothing about. Uh, one was jet streams, the other was clear air turbulence. One is safe, the other one is dangerous. We were off this night during a nav cross country, strictly DR, uh, dead reckoning. We were loud bearings, uh, using the met wind. We'd been airborne about an hour and a half. And I saw the navigator get a rather busy head beside me. And uh, he said, what's up? And he said, I don't know. He said, something's gone haywire. <laughs> under the lights, there were a lot of, under the clouds, a lot of lights would begin to appear. Now, where we were supposed to be, there were no lights at all. <laughs> so I called it from bearing to get a position. And when the navigator worked it out, we discovered we were over London. <laughs> we were supposed to be over Western England, over Wales. <laughs> So you can see our navigation go for a burden. When we got on the ground again, the navigator back plotted this flight, and in the period that we were airborne, to have got where we were, we had to have a wind of 160 knots. It was our first test of a jet stream. But nobody knew about it. They, they, were, they were unheard of. A year later, I'm on Mark 34, we're doing photography over Germany. Our target is Frederickshaven on Lake Geneva. When we left, well, 76,000 again, when we left France, we ran out of that age, so we, we were dead reckoning again. But we hit it on the button, we took the photograph of it, and then we headed north, we had two targets up by the Iron Curtain. But as we traveled north, the cloud rolled in underneath us, there was no chance of photography, but not to worry, we flew to ETA, and then he gave me a course back to England. We'd been on that course for about 10 to 15 minutes, when he decided it was no time which on another age could be back in France. So I watched him for a while, he was thinking around, and I said, have they gone bum? He said, no, they're working. Well, I said, what's wrong? He said, no, I don't know, but there's nothing coming in. I said, do you want me to start this heading? He said, yes. So we must have gone another 10 minutes or more before he started getting active. We were now picking up the first of the eastern chain, followed by the southern chain. He was able to pot our position, and after a while, he gave me a note. He said, do you know where we've been? I said, no. He said, 150 miles in Russia. <laughs> that was our second jet stream. <laughs> <laughs> now, here, that's the one-on-one. I press that little red button in the middle, he says. There, on base there. Now, when we, we did North Carolina work here around the Mediterranean. I've been over here, I've landed back down three times, that was running quiet before the trouble started. Right? We, used to, we used to land to south of Cairo for fuel. If we were in the north of the Mediterranean, we'd land at Malta for fuel. But if we were in the south, south of Tripoli here, 50 miles in the desert, is Castle Benito on the edge of the Sahara Desert. We used to come there. And if we were at the western end, it read, uh, no, here, it was there, rather. And then if it was at the western end, we used to land at Gibraltar. The Lancaster would take eight hours. The Mosquito did it in five and a half. In the Canberra's we did it in three. In one day I did the journey in two and a half. Because we found a jet stream. My navigator said, there's a jet stream around here, can we use it? He said, yes. But he started the track. He said, instead of going direct down to here, 
You see, if we go here to San Azir, we can pick it up from here, it runs down here. See? Now, a jet stream, it's nothing but rivers of air bumped into the, the, the atmosphere. Passengers talk about falling into whole pocket vacuums. There's no such thing. Air abhors a vacuum. It, air is like a fluid, it flows. And so you've got these jet streams that travel around the world, roughly from the northwest to the southwest, and they're eastly directed, of course, the coral almost to the earth. And this one was running, as I say, from San Azir to here. We hopped into it. It wasn't at 48,000, it was at 41,000. As we got into it, there was a little trembling, as far as I was concerned, like driving over railway tracks in a car. But that stopped as I got into the jet stream. You see, my navigator gave the heading I wanted. The map meter flapped around a bit. It flapped around a bit for me, and it finally settled down. I didn't know I was on the jet stream, but the navigator did. He was busy, because he gave me an ETA for here. And I said, we're cranking on a bit, aren't we? He said, yes. Our ground speed is 660 knots. <laughs> Over 700 miles an hour we were doing. Try map reading at that speed. <laughs> so we, we did a journey of two and a half, from eight hours down to two and a half. So anyways, we had briefing one day, met briefing one day, nothing on. And as we wandered towards the hangar, the aircraft parked outside. Before I go any farther though, I let me backtrack a bit. Uh, the Mosquito was a won wonderful aircraft. It had one major fault. It had slow retracting undercarriage. The average fighter gets up in three to five seconds. Quite a aircraft. The average is seven to fifteen. <coughs> the mosquito took twenty-five to thirty seconds to get up. <coughs> but it could move, right? Now, we used to fly the Mark 35, 34, 35, 36,000 feet, and it indicated the airspeed of 286 knots. Remember that figure, 286 knots. Fast forward now to about 1982. I'm out of Carafa, heading south to Perth and time off, and I'm a passenger on the board, an F-28 twin jet. Um, Fokker Friendship, Fokker Fellowship. There weren't many on board, and the pretty hostess come down to me, I liked her. Well, I had all sorts of things I'd like to do, but I bit the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I bit the tongue. I said, would you ask the skipper what Mac number we're doing? She really didn't know what I was talking about. I said, M-A-C-H. I said, he'll know. So she wandered up the front. And then she came back with a little piece of paper. I still got it. He, skipper, must have said to the first officer, we've got a smart bastard down the back, here it works. <laughs> so there's a little bit of paper turned up, and it says, we the twin jet was flying at 33,000 feet. It had an indicated airspeed of 275 knots. It had a true airspeed of 424 knots, or 788 miles an hour, or, or uh, 488 miles an hour, or 780 kilometers an hour, or 0.7 Mach. They were all the same speed. Right? Hence you need a navigator. <laughs> so the F-28, the twin jet, was travelling at 275 knots. We were doing 286 of the mosquito. We were faster than a twin jet. We, had, we were travelling about 0.72 Mach, but we didn't have a Mach meter on board. We had an airspeed indicator. So that was, it was a wonderful aircraft, the, the mosquito was. And so this morning we were walking to the hangar, they were parked outside, wondered why. And when we walked to the centre of the hangar, our brakes went, we stopped. We were sitting there in the middle of the hangar was the Mark III photographic version of the Canberra bomber. Magnificent. It's slightly bigger than the B-2 to carry more fuel. <coughs> the engine is more powerful. It was, it was duck egg blue in colour. Beautiful. The door was open. The door was open as such. And so we climbed in, had a look. Navigator went there and I went there. I sat in the jump seat, or the ejector seat. And I stood in the office sort of thing. And I thought, Ooh. About seven or eight minutes ago, they never said a word. We climbed out, we stood in, out by the door as we got out, we stood and faced one another. Not a word was said. We both shook our head like this, saying, This was bigger than both of us. We never coped with this sort of thing. But it wasn't to be. 
The Bowman boys are a massive born but they're driving on the beach as quick as they could. They were coming from a Lincoln Point Lincoln to a twin inch camera. It was a nine week course. They had the beauty of a T4, which is a camera side by side seating for, for pilot conversion. We didn't have that luxury. We were given the paperwork to read. To get used to jet handling, that brought in a meteor fighter, which we converted on we threw that around the sky to get some idea of light. When the day arrived, when the instructor came in, and he said, Sergeant Ward, if you never get it, your turn to have arrived the camera. So we got all the fancy gear on, reported to the aircraft, climbed on board, and the navigator instructor was there, my navigator was signing in. My instructor was here, and I sat on a little jump seat that folded down, no backrest, left strap, and connection for radio and oxygen. Everything was over here, which the, the instructor had. Once the door was shut, he started his speed. What is before? What was that for? What should you do with that? What should you do with that? I mean, the engine rumbled into life. We taxied out onto the wrong way. We took off. When we went down the, the wrong way, we climbed up past that 6,000. I expect we would have stopped at that 6,000. We didn't. That was old hat now. That was, that was, that was mosquito here. We now went to a cruising out through the 48,000 feet. That's where we would operate on from now on. 48,000 feet, because I'm looking at that, looking around, but I don't have an opportunity. That instructor was still talking, still pointing this out, throwing the aircraft around to show what it could do. Um, we did max rate descents, max speeds, you think of it. We stalled it, and we worked, we worked, we worked our way down. He switched out one engine, and we, we lit it. You can't let a jet engine above 20,000, it's not above oxygen. So we had to be below 20,000. He put out the start, the other one, and we lit it. Eventually, in an hour, we were in the circuit and we landed on the runway. And I thought, not bad. Three or four more trips like that, I'll get a hang of this bastard sort of thing. No, <laughs> no I, not by that. He, he, not, not like he taxied the road and parked by the caravan, put the brakes on and idled the engine, and started getting out of the seat and taking his harness out. And I said, What are you doing? He said, Hopping over the other guy. I said, Push off, there's only one pole. <laughs> he said, Have a go, you'll love it. <laughs> I was young enough then, you know. So I climbed on board, I adjusted myself. He sat on a little jump seat with nothing, I had everything. What do you want me to do? He said, just like I've done. <laughs> so I eased the brakes off, and I trundled off the runway. I lined it up, put the brakes on, did a cockpit check, took a deep breath, let the brakes go, and pulled on power. Now I was used to 2,000 horsepower, and I was side of the mozzie. Suddenly, under the bonnet, I had six times as much power. We went down that room and I saw the cat. So I think, the runway won't come up, and I pulled it off. Up we went, so I think. I was at 5,000, I think, for I had a second breath. I'm not certain. It was a wild ride. But I did all that he said, all the way up to 48,000 feet, max rate descent, engine sound, real hit, and what have you, and came back, and I hit the circuit, and I greased this thing on the runway as though I'd been flying 100 hours. When we got out of this person, he said, that's your conversion. I'll see you later on. <laughs> Not a nine-week conversion, one hour. <laughs> but I worked on my own. All the boys on the squad that did it, 58 squadron, 540 squadron, 542 squadron. All the, all the PR boys were converted the same way. The bomber boys had the luxury. We had lots of frights, lots, lots of um, <coughs> and, 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 and excitement, sort of thing. I'm the thing. So we're, on, we're on cameras now, right. Um, the weather's clamped. Cloud base is 150 feet, 200 feet. It's solid. They're not flying the weather, but suddenly uh, they wanted a select crew, which I was one of, you see, to do a photo in Italy. The Mediterranean was clear. So we got the job, and we, <coughs> found that we took off. Almost before the wheels were up in the bay, we were in the tank. We punched away through the top, out of the sunshine, the 48,000 feet, and headed for, headed for Italy. We did photography from here. We did a run down there. We did a run back there. And we did a run down there. And we turned and did a run that way. To wrap it all up. When it was all done, we had, we could have got back, but we, I decided we, with the weather, we better have full tanks. So I hauled off the power 
and a doctor from Malta. And uh, we had lunch, we had food tanks, and we took off, and as we plowed away from, from Malta here, Sicily disappeared under the starboard wing. We passed over the top of Sardinia, Corsica was down there, and we entered at uh, Marseille to head for home. But before we got to Marseille, uh, the weather was solid, literally solid. I mean, uh, it worried me for a moment, then the penny dropped. That cloud below me, I was at 48,000 feet, that cloud below me was at least 40,000 feet. Now, at 40,000 feet, you normally got cirrus, mere tiles. Uh, but this was solid, sort of thing, you see. So, we carried on, and when we got up to France, I cleared the Paris control, asked London for permission to enter British airspace. He passed me back to my own people. I called them up, gave them an ETA. Soon after, the navigator said, commence your descent, which I did. I pulled off the power, and I ran into cloud at 42,000 feet. I went instantly to 42,000 feet. I was hoping for a break, uh, wrong again. So I switched on this CRDF, cathode ray direction finder, which is a great improvement on the old ADF, which said that way, 75 miles for overhead base. So we came over the top to do a normal let down landing east west. Well, before we got there, control car called up and they said, Would you like GTA? I said, Did it operate? And they said, Yes, the GTA, I don't know if you've done it. They talked you down for landing. So they brought me up the top of 25, and then they fed me northeastly to about 12 and a half thousand feet, came back southerly in line with the wrong way, about 1,500 feet, about 10 miles up, where he handed me over to the controller. Previous to that, you answered everything. Once you've made contact with the controller, you then shut up and listen to him. He talked you down the glide path. Right? So you're 1,500 feet, about 15 miles to go. You've got to watch your speed from 200 knots down to 125 of the hedge. You've got to get your own chairs down, get your flaps down, you've got to maintain the heading, plus you've got to stay on the glide path because he's watching you by radar. We've just gone through 500 feet when he took a breath, and we never get to say, you're drifting to port. So I corrected that. It was just as thick, I could hardly see the tip tanks. The controller came on, he said, the radar descent is good, you're drifting to port. No, he said, maintain that heading is perfect. Right? 300 feet, no change. 200 feet, no change. 100 feet, exactly the same. <laughs> At 50 feet, the instructor said, the controller said, look ahead and land, which, which I did. Couldn't see a bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> At 40 feet was the first shimmer of the change. At 30 feet, when I crossed 30 feet, the threshold went under, threshold lights went under the aircraft, the center line of the runway was over the nose, I just eased off the power and settled on the ground. <laughs> when we got out at the dispersal, I looked up the top of up the canvas, 15 foot 7. The cloud base was just twice as high, 30 feet. And that had been solid all the way to 42,000 feet. I reckon that was climate change then. Right? Uh, but, I, but I think I've got to stop there, I'm going to get time. I'd have to leave you there, folks. There's plenty more to come. We'll have to wait for another day. <laughs> Taken off in Gibraltar. That's Spain over there. We, I'm, that's my the navigator system behind me there. And the control tanks. That's it, Phil. This is the girl. Here we are. Thank you. <laughs>